My name is Ashley Lodge, and in 2010, I was diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Like any good nerd, and I am a very good nerd, I immediately started searching online for what that meant for me and for my future. This made me aware of how big of an issue accessibility was and still is. Like many temporarily able-bodied people, I didn't consider these issues until they potentially affected me. Since I'm a programmer, I looked for things I could do in my day-to-day -day job to increase accessibility. I had to do this on my own time because it was never taught in college or brought up at any programming job I've ever had. I made a point of following disabled people and disability communities so I can continue to learn, and I tried to bring up accessibility whenever possible at work. And it turns out it was possible a lot. Just ask my boss. <laughs> Did you know that according to Stats Canada, 20% of the Canadian population between 25 and 64 has a disability? That is over 6 million people. 25 to 64 is also considered the working age population. Who here thinks they're going to be able to retire at 65? <laughs> and of course, the likelihood of disability increases as we age. We have an aging population, and by 2030, nearly a quarter will be seniors. Let's take a step back. What is accessibility, specifically digital or online accessibility? Think about YouTube. If you have a link to a video, you can access it, right? Well, we're all here in Canada, so I'm sure everyone's familiar with the message, the uploader has not made this video available in your country. <laughs> I have the link, but I can't actually access this video. However, if I were to use a VPN to make it seem like I'm in the US, then I would be able to access the video. In this case, I've used the VPN as a type of assistive technology to provide me with the access that I didn't have by default. Now I hit play, and the video is in French. I never had the opportunity to learn French, so the video is inaccessible to me again. Accessibility isn't just one thing, even for people with the same disability. It's multiple factors and pieces all working together to provide people with true access based on their needs at that particular time. Did you know that less than a quarter of children with disabilities are fully supported in school, leading to them being less likely to graduate high school or to attend college or university? Overall, disabled people are employed less and paid less even when they are employed. Technology alone cannot solve these issues but it certainly shouldn't be making them worse either, which can be the case if accessibility isn't considered. For digital accessibility, there are four guiding principles. Perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Together, these make up the acronym POOR. Let's start with perceivable. This is the first step for accessibility and the foundation for the other three elements. After all, how can you understand or operate something if you can't perceive it? All input to our brains comes via one or more senses, with seeing, hearing, and touch the most common ways for humans to convey information. If someone is blind, they would need to use another sense, such as hearing, to access that information instead. You may have heard of screen readers, which are tools that literally read out the underlying code of a website so a user can access it. If you're curious about how screen readers work, nearly everyone in this room has one in their bag or pocket right now. All Apple and Android phones and tablets come with a screen reader built in, and they're pretty easy to pick up and start using. Give it a try on a site that you use all the time. What's the same and what's different about accessing it this way? Can you access it at all? Did you know that the most common categories for disability are pain, flexibility, and mobility, followed by mental health, dexterity, and hearing, and then seeing, learning, and memory. While screen readers are essential tools, focusing on screen reader users means you've ignored six other more common disability categories completely. And of course, disabilities have multiple aspects. Over 75% of disabled people reported in more than one category. 
Another aspect of perceivable is color. A large number of people are colorblind or have low vision, so we need to ensure that there's enough contrast between the background and text colors so content can be seen clearly. We also can't just rely on color to convey meaning. Someone who is red, green, colorblind may not be able to tell the difference between a grade written in green and one written in red. Luckily, making sure that we have enough contrast and that we use indicators other than color on our websites means they'll be more accessible for everyone, not just people with disabilities. Next up, we have operable. How do you usually move around online? Probably by using a mouse or tapping on your phone or tablet, right? If you have to enter information, you use a keyboard. What about people who don't use a mouse and only use a keyboard? What about people who don't use either? Someone with a disability, such as Parkinson's, may not have the fine motor control needed to use a mouse, so they use their keyboard to navigate instead. If they're on their phone or tablet, they may have difficulty with areas that are too small to tap accurately. Operable will generally refer to keyboard accessibility because most assistive devices mimic keyboard functionality. This also makes operable one of the easiest principles to test. I dare everyone here to go home or to work, disconnect your mouse, and try to navigate through a site you use every single day. Is it always clear where you are on the page? Can you use everything you normally would, things like menus and drop-downs and buttons? Do you already know about hot keys, such as using the backspace key instead of the back button? Or do you have to figure it out through trial and error? Speaking of errors, users will make them. We all make mistakes. So we need to provide ways for them to recover from errors. If I've made a post by accident, then I can edit it or delete it and start again. But what if I've just transferred $1,000 to the wrong account? <laughs> Things like confirmation screens, alerts, and warnings benefit all users, not just those with disabilities. And providing instructions before starting a long or complicated process can actually prevent errors before they even happen. These are both examples of inclusive design where instead of designing a product and then figuring out how it might work for people with disabilities, we design a product that works for everyone, including people with disabilities. <laughs> Once your site is perceivable and operable by a wide variety of users, you have to ask, can they understand it? Language choices matter to accessibility. It depends on your audience, but unless you're 100% certain about their background knowledge, culture, life experience, and education, it's best to default to very simple and concise text. Basically, you don't want to use a long word when a short one would work just as well and probably better. So for example, instead of saying additional, you can say added. Instead of contains, you could say has. And rather than expiration, just say end. Functionality also has to be understandable. At some point, developers decided that the hamburger icon would represent a menu. <laughs> <laughs> you know those three stacked horizontal lines? Don't ask me why it's called a hamburger, although I guess it kind of makes sense. Or why it represents a menu, but it does. People are used to this icon. So you shouldn't decide that menus on your site will be represented by fries instead. <laughs> if there is a very good reason to break from the standard, it's key that you're at least consistent within your own site. If you're going to use fries for a menu in one spot, always use fries. Otherwise, people are going to be hungry and start looking for a different type of menu. <laughs> what about when you come to a form for the first time and the save or the next button is disabled? Is it immediately clear what you need to do to enable that button? Or do you have to poke around the form, filling in values at random before it becomes active? This is another example of inclusive design. Someone without a disability might be able to figure out how to get the form working quicker than someone with a disability, but it's a terrible experience for both of those users. Last, but absolutely not least, we have Robust. Does your site work in Chrome? Probably. How about Firefox? 
Probably that one too. What about IE11 and Edge? <laughs> Safari? UC browser? Brave? What about older versions of these browsers? What about the developer or beta versions? Does your app work on an iPhone 5? What about an iPhone X with a notch at the top? What about all the different types of Android devices out there? The key for Robust is that unless there's a critical compatibility issue, everything should just work. Users need to be able to choose their own technologies in order to meet their own unique needs. Now, any developers out there, I know you're glaring at me, <laughs> you don't have to support every version of every browser out there. But you shouldn't be too restrictive. Having a message on your site that it only works in the latest version of Chrome doesn't do anybody any good. If we consider inclusive design as well as accessibility, we have to consider the person who is at work and doesn't have permission to install the latest version of Chrome, as well as the disabled person who can't use Chrome with their assistive technology. If there's a standard, like there is for HTML and CSS, you should follow it. Not only is this better for accessibility, it also provides a certain amount of future-proofing. When Apple first announced that they were making websites available on the watch, they noted that sites using standard HTML would just work. Everyone else, they were in a bit of trouble. Knowing anything about accessibility, even just the word accessibility and a vague idea of what it means, puts you in a better position than many people out there, unfortunately. So what I'll ask from you is to keep accessibility in mind. Remember that small changes are important, and they do add up. Maybe you'll reconsider some assumptions about who uses your product or service, or who visits your store or building. Maybe you're in a position where you can advocate for better physical or digital accessibility in your workplace or organization. For example, I need people to understand that banning single-use plastic straws will kill disabled people. True alternatives must be developed before a ban can be considered. Don't. <laughs> Don't forget about your internal tools and systems either. Just because it's not a product you're selling doesn't mean that accessibility doesn't matter. Could you hire a disabled person tomorrow and have them experience your workplace the same way a temporarily able-bodied person would? Not everything's about work. What about in your personal life? Did you know that the major social media platforms all have a feature that allows you to add alt text to images? Alternative, or alt text, is a description of an image that's read out by a screen reader. It's terrible that this isn't enabled by default, but check out the settings on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and start adding alt text to all of your images so they're accessible to everyone. Unfortunately, you can't add alt text to a GIF, but you could include a description as part of your content. If you're posting video or audio, include transcripts and captions. Really, you never know when you're going to go viral, and everyone really should be able to experience your brilliance and wit. <laughs> I'm here to put accessibility into your heads, and I hope you will do the same with others in your communities. Thank you.